second day of uh, the third conference of uh, the ESRB. Uh, it's a, a tradition. Uh, I'm Francesco Mazzafer. I'm the head of the ESRB secretary that I'm opening the second day, admittedly in the early morning, uh, with a few remarks on the work seen from the side of the ESRB secretariat. And it's also an occasion to thank my, my deputy, Thomas Peltonen, and many, many colleagues uh, for the great work done. How do we see macroprudential uh, policy from the Secretariat uh, at the present stage? I would say we see it as uh, something which is alive and kicking. And by the way, it's interesting that uh, everything which has been discussed yesterday is seen from our angle very often in operational terms. For example, we get notification of policies, a decision from, uh, from member states, we discuss reciprocation. All issues which have to do with the policy making have their dimension also in terms of managing the decision process, making sure this is well understood, explained, and also recognized at the European level. Let me say there has been a lot of these activities. It was already mentioned by uh, President Draghi and by uh, Governor Lane yesterday that seven EU member states have announced an increase in their countercyclical capital buffer since the start of the year. And I think, and I think we think and in general the Secretariat, this is the new normal. We will enter into a phase into which having the, the countercyclical capital buffer in action including having that 0%, which is also a policy decision, will be part of policy making in our countries. All in all, the, the use of macroprudential policy has been prudent. I would like to say this because for some years we were confronted with the argument coming very often from the industry uh, that we would have not been taking into account their issues, their problems, the problems of, uh, of the economy. I think the use of policy has been parsimonious, very much in line with cyclical conditions, very much also in line with the fact that we were not fully aware of the transmission mechanism. But now, more and more, authorities are getting uh, more confident and they are making use of the tools. And the strengthening of the cycle in many countries, as has been explained yesterday, has now justified the use of uh, macroprudential instruments in a few economies. Good news, uh, the, the current review of the CRD-CRR, which is a bit of funding legislation of macroprudential of policy, might include, uh, as from some months from now, new provisions, which would aim us uh, at uh, having a more chirurgical use of the tools, uh, facilitating the application of buffers to given sectors. We have been speaking a lot about the real estate uh, yesterday, so it would be possible to use the counter-cyclical capital buffer or the systemic risk buffer for specific vulnerabilities. And this will certainly help authorities with cope with the areas of concern. Against uh, uh, this background, uh, an important uh, area of work at the Secretariat, but also jointly with all the institutions which are part of our network, has been uh, to progress in identifying the concept of macroprudential stance. We know about uh, monetary policy stance, we know about fiscal policy stance, Macroprudential stance, when we started to discuss about this, uh, was considered a concept very, very difficult to identify. People told it would take some decades before we would be able to make an assessment of this. We are starting not with the idea of having a judgmental attitude. We are not speaking of macroprudential stance because we want to solve or condemn authorities. But we want to help ESRB institutions to reflect on how to discuss the appropriateness of their assessment and policy action. We need, to a certain extent, to, to, to assess how and why 
and under which condition macroprudential policymakers may intentionally wish to be tight, to be neutral, or to be loose in their policy making as a conscious stance choice. And on this, I'm very glad to, to announce uh, that we will have uh, a workshop to be held here in Frankfurt on the 31st of October, uh, together with the colleagues of the IMF and the, and the ECB. Another issue to which we have been devoting great attention, including yesterday as the general board, is the role insurance uh, is playing in either absorbing or propagating risks. The, the role of uh, insurance as a shock absorber is most known because of the inverted business cycle and the long profile of their liabilities. Uh, insurance corporations are most protected uh, than banking, than banks from sudden shocks. They can invest long term and take position in illiquid assets. This does not exclude, however, that uh, insurance can also be part of the problem under certain conditions. And we have been looking at questions including uh, the impact of insurance behavior on cyclical conditions and the possible procyclical role of insurance uh, activities, their systemicness, and even certain questions concerning liquidity. New tools in the area of insurance may be needed and to this aim, uh, we think that uh, two avenues could be followed and should in fact be followed in, part, uh, in parallel. In some cases, I think we will need to have some monitoring based on uh, data collection so that we could design instruments for the future. In other areas, it might be even more prudent to establish immediately a legal basis for new tools in occasion of the 2020 review of Solvency II. Now, let me uh, go through very rapidly other areas of work, also reflecting on the topics uh, which will be discussed in the morning today. The first one uh, is uh, about the global aspects of macroprudential policy. Of course, here let me say that one of the questions which we will have to ask ourselves in the immediate future will be what does it mean to have the city close to the euro area being one enormous huge financial center which is not anymore in the borders of the Union but is belong, becoming part of the international activity, because this uh, really gives a completely new dimension to the discussion on the global role of macroprudential policy. The second question on which we have been working a lot is the, the role of big data. Uh, we are hosting uh, uh, some of the largest ever uh, uh, financial data uh, in the area of uh, uh, some markets, for example, EMIR uh, is, uh, is one of, uh, when we started to get EMIR, now we don't do it anymore in this way, but when we started to get EMIR, the first problem was how to use it without having basically part of the bank stuck, simply because we were running, uh, we were running the data, the database. We are uh, receiving very soon data from AFMD, uh, which is uh, the data uh, based on alternative investment funds. We will have uh, access uh, to uh, information on securities financing transactions and, so, and on securitization. Other uh, members of our network will have access to six to eight databases which are produced from MIFID. So all of this, uh, a part of the logistical issue of being able to work on this, apart from the statistical questions of being able to interpret this data appropriately, also raises the, poli the policy issue of how to make sure that in the future decision-making will be 
completely based on evidence uh, and uh, uh, on a capacity to analyze the data which have been collected uh, from industry. We do it to industry itself, because for industry it's a cost. We do it also to uh, the democratic legislator which has provided us with this uh, information. And so I think more and more we will have to reflect on, on how to be able to cross these sources of information with a more ordinary type of monitoring which we are doing on, on risks. But the way, let me say that uh, uh, we, we are, on the one hand, extremely grateful to the ECB, which is asking us for the investment which is done uh, on data. On the other hand, we are also trying to innovate. We have been launching a new visitor program, which is called Bridge, which is bringing data scientists in-house uh, in order to better understand all these issues. Another area on which we have been advancing has been uh, cyber risk. We have been trying to ask us questions which go beyond the valuable and very important activities which have already been uh, performed by other institutions. In particular, we have been asking ourselves, when is cyber risk systemic? What does it mean that cyber attacks would make the financial sector unable to provide its services to the economy? What would be the role of public, of public institutions? We are working on this. Uh, there is a, a working group which is chaired by, by the Bank of England on this. Uh, it will be discussed at the general board in December, and we, we hope to continue to work on this because it's a topic which is not certainly going away simply because we have been discussing and publishing a nice, a nice report. I could say much more, and I will simply, as a bullet point, say, tell you that we are working on issues concerning branchification, which is not, uh, so to speak, uh, a, a dirty work. Uh, to, to use branches in the single market is the completely right of the economic agents. Of course, we have to make sure that there is improved exchange of information between uh, micro and macro authorities. We want to understand uh, how recognition of measures is uh, taking place within Europe. We are now discussing some interesting, some interesting cases. Uh, of course, measures become more and more innovative, and uh, recognition from other countries uh, requires great attention. And we are trying to understand also how to better assess the implementation of uh, uh, our past recommendation. But I would like to, 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 to finish uh, here. I've been already speaking very shortly about some of the topics which are due for discussion today, the global macro prudential uh, dimension, the big data, shadow banking. And uh, I would like now to, to, to give the floor to uh, Claudia Buch, Vice President of the Deutsche Bundesbank, who will uh, chair the next session. Thank you very much.